Modern man and modern tools. It's impossible to separate one from the other. With the aid of tools, man has changed the face of his world. And as the world has changed, tools have become increasingly varied and specialized. But how did the marriage between man and tool begin? From where came the idea of making and using tools? Perhaps from the sea otter, who uses rocks to open shellfish. Or the Egyptian vulture, who has learned how to crack the shells of ostrich eggs. More likely, early man studied his distant cousins, like the chimpanzee. By observing carefully, man has learned that stiff blades of grass could be used to draw tasty termites out of hiding. Now here was an idea he could use. Technology was born. And as new situations occurred, new tools were invented to handle them. With tools, man could build and control, taming the land and beginning his struggle to conquer the seas. He began to specialize, creating tools for even the most delicate task. With the Industrial Revolution came the need for tools to build and repair astonishing new inventions. And it is only because of his tools and the machines he can create with tools that man has dared to venture from his planet. And Eagle Houston, we got data dropout. You're still looking good. Man is a tool-using animal, wrote philosopher Thomas Carlyle in 1833. Without tools, he is nothing. With tools, he is all. Tools have given scientists and engineers the means for accomplishing amazing feats, even to the point of turning science fiction into science fact. But using tools is something we all do from the time we're old enough to feed ourselves. After all, a spoon is a tool, and so is the toothbrush, one of the first tools we use in learning to take care of our bodies. From there, we go on to use other tools like these to express ourselves and to form simple materials like paper into shapes we see in our minds. Some of the tools we learn to use, we carry with us almost everywhere we go, like a pocket knife. Others are found only in workshops or on the job. The point is that we're surrounded by tools and that we use tools almost every day of our lives. Yet at some time, you and I misuse the same tools we depend on. In some cases, we're just too lazy to find the right tool for the job. Other times, we abuse tools simply because we've never learned how to use them properly. Then when we skin our knuckles or smash our thumbs, we blame our wrenches, hammers, and screwdrivers. But most experienced mechanics will tell you that accidents are more often the fault of the tool user than the tool being used. In learning to use and care for hand tools, the first thing to remember is that a tool, any tool, is an extension of the person using it. This hammer, for an example, is an extension of my forearm and fist. Using a hammer correctly literally makes my arm longer multiplying the muscle power of my arm. These pliers are holding tools. Using pliers properly multiplies the gripping power of my hand. 
each tool has a different purpose, and it doesn't take too much to understand that pliers can't do a hammer's job, and a hammer can't do a plier's job. So the most important thing to remember about all the tools we'll see in this unit is always use the right tool for the job. Using any tool for a purpose it isn't designed for can not only ruin the tool you're using, but also damage the equipment you're working on and create a safety hazard to yourself and others. Okay then, following the rule of always using the right tool for the job, let's take a look at one of the oldest and most basic of hand tools, the hammer. The hammer is a striking tool. It's used to drive nails and rivets, shape and flatten metals, drive wedges, break rock and concrete, and so on. But like other tools, the hammer has become specialized. As you can see, there's a different hammer for every job. This hammer, for example, is a machinist or ball peen hammer. It's used primarily to drive rivets and to shape metal. The parts of a ball peen hammer are basically the same as the parts of any hammer. The handle and the head. This part of the head is the face. On a ball peen hammer, the face is slightly rounded for driving metal pins and striking chisels, punches, and other metal working tools. The other end of the head is called a peen. The peen on a ball peen hammer is rounded. This enables it to strike small rivets and brads without striking or damaging the surrounding metal. Before using any hammer, it's important to check that the hammer is in good condition. This means inspecting the handle for any cracks or splintering that could cause it to break on impact. It also means checking the head for dents or flat spots that could cause the hammer to glance off the work. Just as important is making sure that the head is securely attached to that handle. On hammers with wooden handles, the head has an opening called an eye that the handle fits into. A wedge driven into the end of the handle expands the wood, holding the head firmly in the eye. Now sometimes this wedge works itself loose, or the wood dries out and shrinks from being left out in the sun or near a heat source. This causes the head to loosen. Using a hammer that has a loose head is a sure way of causing damage or injury. So when using a hammer with a wooden handle, always check that the head is tight on its handle. If you find that the wedge is loose, drive it back in until the handle's tight again. If for any reason the wedge can't be tightened, or if the handle is damaged, replace the handle and wedge immediately. Now, using a hammer begins with gripping it properly. Remember, a hammer is an extension of your arm and fist. The farther it extends out from your arm, the better it works. So hold the handle as close to the end as is comfortable. This way, you'll get the most striking force out of the least amount of effort. Now, on this uh, shaft, we have a metal pin to be driven. Since the pin doesn't have to be countersunk or flush with the surface of the work, we'll drive it in with the face of the hammer. Why? Well, the face has a larger surface area than the ball peen. It's also flatter, which reduces the chances of its glancing off the pin or driving it crookedly. Now we're ready to start, right? No. There's something we've forgotten. Safety goggles. Now the reason we use these safety goggles is that when you strike a metal surface with a metal hammer, you often get small chips and pieces flying about and you could uh, easily damage your eyes. Okay, we're all set. I get a good grip near the end of the handle and I lay the face of the hammer squarely on the pin. Lining up like this gives me a feel for the target, reducing my chances of missing the pin and damaging the work, or hitting the pin with the handle and ruining the handle. 
For the pin to be driven straight, the face of the hammer has to hit it squarely, like this. Hitting the pin like this will only bend or break it. This also holds true when using other types of hammers to strike chisels, drive nails, and so on. Now, once I'm properly lined up, I raise the hammer far enough so that it comes down with sufficient force and Notice that I've left the pin sticking up just a bit. Hammering it down all the way with the face of the hammer could possibly dent or otherwise damage the work. If the pin had to be flush with the surface, I'd use the peen to drive it the rest of the way. So there you have it, the basic method for using a hammer, particularly a ball peen or a machinist hammer. I might add that when you finish with any tool, you should wipe the metal surfaces with a lightly oiled rag. This removes dirt as well as coating the metal with a thin film of oil that protects it against corrosion. Then be sure to store the tool properly. And of course, the best place to store a tool properly is a tool box. So, In that way, it'll keep water away from the tool, uh, water that might wash off the oil and form rust, and heat that could dry out the wood. Before going on to other types of hammers, let's stop to give you a chance to read the section of your text. That's section one. In the next segment, we'll look at hammers designed for driving and pulling nails, chipping slag, breaking rock and concrete, and other jobs requiring striking force. In the first segment, we focused on the machinist, or ball-peen hammer, and looked at the basic procedure for using hammers. In this segment, we'll look at carpenter's hammers, sledge hammers, chipping hammers, and a special category of hammers called mallets. As its name suggests, the carpenter's hammer is used primarily for driving nails into wood. The carpenter's hammer has a flat face for driving nails without bending the nail heads and a claw in place of a peen. The claw is used for removing nails. In some cases, the hammer and handle are a single piece of metal, so there's little danger of the head breaking loose. But on handles of this type, check to be certain the rubber grip isn't torn or damaged. A loose or damaged grip could slip off the handle in mid-swing sending the hammer off into space. To use a carpenter's ha hammer, follow the same rules that apply to ball-peen hammers. First, wear your safety goggles. Second, hold the hammer properly with your hand near the end of the handle. Third, Line up your hammer so that it'll hit the target squarely. Now, to start a nail into a board, give the nail a tap or two while you hold it. This will get the nail started so you can finish driving it without holding it. Now, what about using a carpenter's hammer to remove a nail? Start. by backing the nail out of ways by hitting the point a couple of times. Then flip the work over and set the hammer in position with the claw directly below the head of the nail. And lift. If the nail is as long as this one though, no amount of pulling from this position is going to free it from the wood. So let me show you a trick. Raising the hammerhead on a block of wood increases your leverage and lets you pull out even the longest nails. 
just like that. Again, when you're finished, wipe the metal surfaces of the tool with a lightly oiled rag. But don't oil any rubber grip. Oil will make the grip too slippery to hold securely. Next on our list is the sledgehammer. Like other hammers, sledgehammers come in a variety of weights and sizes, so you can always find the right size and wait for the job. Sledges are shaped for pounding and are made of high carbon steel, so they can take high impact forces. Short handle sledges, like this one, have dozens of uses. They can be used to strike coal chisels, star drills, or special wrenches called slugging wrenches. Small sledges should be treated like other wood-handled hammers, but perhaps even more carefully because sledges are heavy and can cause more damage than other types of hammers if an accident occurs. Large, long-handled sledgehammers are used for breaking rock and concrete, driving stakes and spikes, and striking coal chisels and wedges. Sliding one hand along the handle is important for getting full force out of your swing, but it can be hard on the hands, so in addition to wearing safety goggles to protect your eyes, wear gloves. And before you start, be certain that there aren't any splinters or cracks in the handle. Also, be careful of your aim. A miss with a heavy sledge can end up as a broken foot or shin. In addition, if the face of the sledge doesn't hit the work squarely, the sledge can glance off with equally unpleasant results. Another type of hammer you'll frequently use is this one, the chipping hammer. Instead of flat or slightly rounded faces for driving nails or pins, chipping hammers have sharp chisel-like edges that can be used to do jobs like chipping slag off welds. The hammer should be aimed so that the sharp edge strikes the work at a small angle. This brings the force of the blow against the slag or other material to be removed, not against the work itself. Striking the edge straight down against the work will only damage the work without removing any foreign matter. And when you chip, chip so that the bits of material fly away from your face and eyes. Now the hammers we've seen so far are hard-headed. That is, they have hard steel faces, but sometimes a steel hammer isn't right for the job. For striking wood handle chisels, driving wooden stakes, or tapping equipment into position, a steel-faced hammer would be a disaster. For jobs like that, you need a soft-faced hammer or mallet. A mallet's head can be made of almost any relatively soft material. Wood, brass, copper, lead, rubber, plastic, even tightly rolled rawhide. And the mallet you select will depend on the job you have to do. Remember though that mallets are soft and are more easily damaged through abuse, so be careful not to use them for purposes that hard-headed hammers are designed for. When storing mallets with wooden or rawhide heads, oil the head lightly to prevent the material from drying out. There are dozens of different types of hammers that we haven't mentioned, but they all exert a striking force, and they're all related to the ones we've seen in this segment. So their use is governed by the same rules. In the next segment, we'll look at a family of tools that exert a twisting force, acting as powerful extensions of hands, wrists, and arms. The threaded fastener is such a strong and reliable design that we use it everywhere. Bolts, screws, studs, even pipes and pipe fittings are threaded to form secure connections between parts. Of course, unlike nails and pins, threaded fasteners can't be pounded into place with hammers. So when screw fasteners were invented around the 15th century, tools that could tighten and loosen them became a necessity. Today, the two most common tools used to tighten and loosen threaded parts are wrenches and screwdrivers. Let's set screwdrivers aside until a later segment and concentrate on wrenches. As a group, wrenches provide the turning or twisting force necessary 
for tightening and loosening bolts, nuts, threaded pipes, and other threaded parts. And as you can see by the small sampling here, there are as many different types of wrenches as there are threaded devices. The most basic type of wrench is the open end wrench. From this set, you can see that open end wrenches come in a variety of sizes corresponding to the various size standard bolts and nuts used throughout industry. Although there are metric wrenches, this set is an English set, measured in inches. This one, for example, is a 9 16 by 5 8 open end wrench. This means that the jaws at one end of the wrench fit bolt heads measuring 9 16 of an inch across, and the jaws at the other end fit only 5 8 of an inch bolt heads. The sizes of the bolts and nuts the wrench fits are stamped on the handle. The smallest open end wrench in this set is made for 5 16 of an inch and quarter inch bolts and nuts. That makes this a 5 16 by 1 quarter inch open end wrench. Open end wrenches are used where working room is no problem. Here, for example, there's nothing obstructing the bolts at all, so we have no problem getting an open end wrench to do the job. Now the first step is to select the proper size wrench for the job. This wrench fits around the bolt head all right, but it doesn't fit snugly. If we tried turning the bolt with this wrench, the full force would fall against the edges of the bolt instead of the flats of the bolt. As a result, we'd round off the edges and make the bolt next to impossible to tighten or remove. This one is the proper size wrench for the job. The flats of the jaws fit snugly against the flats of the bolt, so we're sure the twisting force will be exerted in the right places. Once you have the right wrench, you have to make sure it's in good condition. This one is, but if you find the jaws bent or gouged, find another wrench. Using a damaged wrench leads to scraped knuckles and rounded off bolts. Now in this case we're going to use another wrench to hold our bolt in place while we tighten it because there's a nut on the bottom, like so. Now another knuckle saving practice is to always pull on the wrench, never push on it. If you're pulling on a wrench and it slips, your hand is going to slip toward you. But if you're pushing on a wrench when it slips, your hand is going to end up smashing against the equipment you're working near. So, let's give it a couple of turns. Like so. There, we have it. The bolt is tight, but notice that I don't over tighten it. Forcing a snug bolt can ruin the threads and, in some cases, actually damage the equipment. Now, what do we do with a bolt like this one that has a small maneuvering space? Well, let's see. We'll use the other wrench to assist as we did before. Get a grip on that nut. There we are. Now, notice that after each turn, I flip the wrench over. Why? Well, the jaws on most open-end wrenches are offset 15 degrees from the handle. After the first turn, the wrench can't get another grip on the bolt head until it's flipped over. Let's show you that again. A turn, a flip, and another turn. This allows me, flipping it, to get a new gripping angle. Again, I don't over-tighten the bolt. I leave it snug. 
Before going on to other types of wrenches, let me point out that not all open-end wrenches are angled at 15 degrees. Some are angled as much as 90 degrees. A close relative of the open-end wrench is the box-end wrench. The box-end wrench gets its name from the fact that it completely surrounds the bolt or nut. Because of this, it's less likely to slip and is therefore considered safer to use than an open-end wrench. Most often, box-end wrenches are found in two forms, either on a double-ended tool, very similar to the open-end wrenches we looked at, or at the other end of an open-end wrench. A wrench with an open end and a box end on the same handle is called a combination wrench. There are two features of the box wrench that you should keep in mind. One is the points lining the inside of the wrench. And the other is the way the handle is offset. Because both features are designed to make the box wrench easy to use in tight spots. The points are part of the wrench that actually grips the fastener. This arrangement enables you to grip the bolt from a variety of angles. So, for example, I start with the wrench as far down on the bolt as it will go and pull the handle toward me to tighten the bolt. To continue turning the bolt, I have to get a new grip, and although I have to lift the box end wrench off the bolt I don't have to flip it over instead the arrangement of points enables me to grip the bolt from a new angle in effect then the points on a box end wrench replace the angle of the jaws on an open end wrench as a matter of fact the number of points 12 on this wrench allows me to work in even tighter spots than the open end does. I want to point out that box wrenches are not limited to 12 points though. Some have as few as 6, some as many as 16. Just remember, the more points, the less stress the wrench can take, since the points have to be made smaller to fit more of them on the tool. As a result, a 6 point box end wrench is a heavy duty type. A 16 point is a light duty type. That brings us to the offset an angle of the handle. Very simply, the offset enables you to reach recessed fasteners and also gives you greater knuckle clearance. If the handle on this wrench weren't offset higher than the box end, it wouldn't clear the other bolts in this particular line. And it would have to be lifted off the bolt every half turn. But as you can see, that's not the case. There are other features of open-end and box-end wrenches that make them easy to use in different situations. So expect to find these two types in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. Regardless of the size or shape of a wrench, though, here are a few tips on how to avoid misusing and perhaps ruining it. First, always check that you have the proper size wrench for the job. Using an oversized wrench is a sure way of rounding off fasteners and skinning your knuckles. Second, inspect the wrench before using it. Make sure the jaws of open-end wrenches aren't bent or gouged. The points of box-end wrenches should all be there and be in good condition. Using a wrench with bent jaws or missing points is asking for trouble. Next, be certain the fastener you're putting the wrench on is clean. Taking the time to clean a bolt head or nut will ensure the good grip necessary for breaking it free. If you're putting a bolt into place, inspect the threads in the head. If the threads are galled, they're not going to fit right and you'll end up wasting a lot of energy trying to get the fastener in place. If the edges of the flats are rounded off, no wrench in the world is going to get a good grip on it. Fourth. Get as much of the wrench as possible on the nut or bolt. Putting a wrench only partway on the fastener reduces its effectiveness. 
It also puts unnecessary stress on both the wrench and the fastener and could damage both. And as I mentioned before, always pull on a wrench. Of course, sometimes this isn't possible because of the location of the fastener you're working on. But you'll find that most sore knuckles result in those tight situations. If you have to push on a wrench, do so carefully and always open-handed so that if it slips, the wrench and not your hand hits the equipment. The next rule is one that's violated more than almost any other. When breaking a fastener free, don't strike the handle of the wrench with a hammer or any other object. And don't put a pipe over the handle to increase your leverage. There are specially designed striking wrenches that are made to be hit with a hammer. Their heavy duty handles can take the impact of a hammer blow, but other wrenches can't. Finally, after you finish with any wrench, clean it if necessary and wipe it with a lightly oiled rag to protect the metal from corrosion. And when you store your wrenches, store them where they'll be easy to find. It's a good idea to store wrenches in order of size to make locating the right one easier. These rules are good common sense ideas that apply to all wrenches, even the ones we'll look at in the next segment. There are two drawbacks to the open end and box end wrenches we looked at in the last segment. The first is that to get a new grip on a nut or a bolt, you have to lift them off the work. So when loosening or tightening a fastener, half your time and effort is spent changing the position of the wrench. The other disadvantage is that each wrench end only fits one size of fastener. So to be prepared for any common size fastener, you have to carry around a whole set of wrenches. And if the handle on a box end or open end wrench isn't offset at exactly the right angle for a particular job, you have no choice but to go search for another wrench. Socket wrenches overcome both these problems. The sockets, which are basically box end wrenches, can be attached to a variety of handles and attachments. Some of these handles eliminate the need for removing the wrench from the work, as we'll see in a moment. And because the sockets are interchangeable, one handle can become almost any size wrench you need. The way it is now, this wrench will fit 3 eighths of an inch fasteners. Now, it'll fit half-inch fasteners. So instead of carrying around a dozen or so individual wrenches, you simply carry a set of sockets and one or two different handles. This versatility has made socket wrenches one of the most convenient and useful tools in industry. But like other hand tools, they have to be properly used and cared for to give reliable service. As we've already seen, a socket wrench consists of two parts the socket and the handle. Like box end wrenches, sockets use points to grip fasteners. Heavy duty sockets can have as few as four points. Light duty sockets have as many as 12. The sockets most commonly used have 12 points. Now the end that attaches to the handle is called the drive end. It has a square or hexagonal hole it's made to receive the square or hexagonal drive lug on the handle, right here. A spring-loaded ball or pin on the lug holds the socket in position. Handles and attachments are available with a variety of different size drive lugs, from quarter-inch drives designed for use on small fasteners to one-and-a-half-inch drives for extremely large fasteners. In general, the larger the drive size, the more force the handle can exert. To match the different size drive lugs, sockets are made with matching drive ends. Again, the larger the drive, the more heavy duty the socket. Basically then, sockets vary in two ways. The size of their wrench ends and the size of their drive ends. 
On the other hand, there's almost no limit to the variety of socket handles. Here we have five of the most common types. The flex head handle or breaker bar, the speeder handle, the sliding T-bar, the reversible ratchet handle, and the spin tight handle. The flex head handle or breaker bar has a hinge drive that can be positioned perpendicular to the bolt to give you the leverage needed to break it free. And then swung upright to make spinning off the fastener easier and quicker. You may also hear these referred to as breaker bars. Speeder handles are shaped like drill braces, enabling you to loosen or tighten a series of fasteners quickly. In many cases, speeder handles also have a hinge drive to make them useful for snugging bolts or breaking them free. Where there's plenty of room to work, a sliding T-bar handle is practical. The drive can be positioned anywhere along the length of the handle. On the end for breaking fasteners free, and in the center for rapid tightening or loosening. For hard to reach places, the reversible ratchet handle is useful. When the control lever is set in one position, the ratchet device locks the socket for tightening, but releases the socket when the handle is swung back to get a new grip. With the lever set in the opposite position, the ratchet works the opposite way, locking the socket for loosening and releasing the socket when the handle is swung back. The spin-tight handle combines the features of a screwdriver and a wrench and is best suited for situations where there is little room around the fastener and a lot of leverage is not required. Socket wrenches are made even more versatile by attachments like this universal joint that enables the handle to rotate in almost any position. And this extension that allows you to reach into holes and deep recesses. We've only touched on a few of the many advantages and features of socket wrenches. You'll learn more about them from your instructor and from the experienced mechanics you'll be working with. But the family of wrenches doesn't end with open end, box end, and socket wrenches, as we'll see in the next segment. In the last two segments, we looked at open end, box end, and socket wrenches, and we learned the basics for the proper use and care of wrenches in general. In this segment, we'll concentrate on four other types of wrenches. Adjustable wrenches, pipe wrenches, spanner wrenches, and Allen wrenches. The first of these is the adjustable wrench. Now, as we'll see, other wrenches can also be adjustable, but the term adjustable wrench usually refers to this type, the adjustable open-end wrench. Adjustable wrenches get their name from the moving jaw and adjustment device that enable them to open or close to fit various size fasteners. This is a definite advantage, but it's also a disadvantage. Adjustable open-end wrenches aren't as strong or durable as solid open-end or box-end wrenches. As a result, you have to pay for the convenience of adjustable jaws with some special care. First, don't use an adjustable wrench if an open-end or box-end wrench can be used. Adjustable wrenches are intended only for use on unusually shaped or odd-sized fasteners and an adjustable wrench should never be used to break a bolt or nut free. Its moving parts can't take the stress. The second rule is one we've seen before. Be sure that the wrench fits the fastener. Just open it up here. Set the wrench in place so that its fixed jaw is flat against one of the flats of the bolt 
or nut. Then turn the adjusting screw until the moving jaw closes snugly against the opposite flat. Thirdly, because the adjustment device and movable jaw are vulnerable to excessive stress, there's only one proper way to use an adjustable wrench. That is by exerting force on the side of the handle attached to the fixed jaw. This way. Never this way. Pulling in the proper direction puts the strain on the fixed jaw where it belongs. Exerting force in the other direction puts the strain on the movable jaw which is more likely to slip off. You can see then that even though adjustable wrenches are convenient, they have limited use because of the weaknesses of their moving parts. Now pipe wrenches also have movable parts. This allows them to adjust to the diameter of various size pipes. But pipe wrenches are designed for more rugged duty than adjustable wrenches and when properly used can handle large amounts of stress. The four basic types of pipe wrenches we'll be looking at are these. Hook jaw pipe wrenches, strap wrenches, chain wrenches, and internal pipe wrenches. Hook jaw pipe wrenches get their name from the shape of their movable jaws. Like other wrenches, hook jaw pipe wrenches come in a wide range of sizes, with 14 and 18 inch lengths being the most widely used. They are adjusted by turning a knurled nut. They also have teeth on their jaws, which help them to grip smooth surfaces. And they're spring-loaded so that their jaws open when being positioned on a pipe and move inward when pressure is applied to the handle. Of course, like adjustable wrenches, hook jaw pipe wrenches have movable parts. And to protect those parts from unnecessary stress and damage, there are a couple of important rules to follow. First, select the proper size wrench for the pipe you're working on. Making a wrench stretch to its limit to fit a pipe lowers the wrench's ability to handle stress. Second, be certain to adjust the wrench so that it touches the pipe only with its toothed jaws. These wrenches are designed to handle stress at only two points. Allowing the back of the movable jaw to touch the pipe adds a third stress point to the wrench and the wrench will slip off when pressure is applied. And finally, always pull the handle towards the open end of the jaws. The fact is that pipe wrenches work only when their handles are pulled in the proper direction. Pull the wrong way and the wrench will slip off the work. Remember too that because of their toothed jaws, pipe wrenches always leave their mark. For this reason, they should never be used on nuts, bolts, or finished surfaces. Two other types of pipe wrenches you're likely to encounter are these. The chain wrench and the strap wrench. Basically, they're the same tool. The only difference being that the strap wrench can be used where a chain wrench would damage the surface of the work. As you can see, the chain on a chain pipe wrench is very similar to a length of bicycle chain. One end of the chain is anchored to the frame, right here. The other end is free. The chain is wrapped around the pipe or cylinder to be turned, and the free end is hooked into the frame. With the chain securely in place, the handle can be pulled to exert force on the work. When the handle is swung back in the opposite direction, the chain loosens so you can get a new grip without removing it from the work. The strap wrench operates on the same principle, but because it has no teeth or chain links, the strap wrench can be used on polished metal and plastic surfaces that a chain wrench or hook jaw wrench would mar. The last type of pipe wrench we want to look at is this type, the internal pipe wrench. The internal pipe wrench exerts force on the inside walls of pipe instead of the outside walls as other pipe wrenches do. This makes it ideal for tightening and removing close nipples and other fittings without damage. Pressure is exerted by these knurled eccentric wheels which expand 
when the wrench is turned. The neural surfaces get a firm grip without damaging the work. Now, in practice, the internal pipe wrench is inserted into the pipe or fixture and rotated until the jaws expand and lock in place. The wrench can then be used to exert twisting force. Besides adjustable wrenches and pipe wrenches, you'll also need to know how to use these two types of wrenches. Spanner wrenches and Allen wrenches. Spanner wrenches are designed to be used only on special types of nuts. A nut like this one, for example, has a small notch in its surface. The spanner wrench that fits it would be this hook spanner wrench, which has a lug that fits right into the notch. Here, the mechanic is tightening a retaining nut on a pump shaft. He sets the lug in the notch on the surface of the nut and pulls back on the handle. The heel of the wrench resting against the nut gives him leverage. Since nuts of this type often have set screw holes in them, remember to keep the heel of the wrench away from the hole. It could damage the hole and prevent you from inserting a set screw. In addition to the regular hook spanner design, there are also adjustable hook spanners, which have hinged hooks to adjust to various size nuts. Other special nuts have their notches or holes on their ends. For turning these nuts, you need a completely different type of spanner wrench. You need an end spanner. End spanner wrenches have their lugs or pins on the ends of U-shaped hooks. Like spanner wrenches, Allen wrenches are limited to use on certain fasteners, namely Allen head fasteners. Allen head fasteners have hexagonal or hex recesses instead of regular heads. The Allen wrench is an L-shaped length of hexagonal stock. Depending on how much leverage you need, you can use either end as a handle. The wrench is operated like this. In this segment, then, we've looked at adjustable wrenches, pipe wrenches, spanner wrenches, and Allen wrenches. Each type is available in a variety of sizes and designs which only goes to show how specialized modern tools have become. But the wrenches on this table are just a sampling of the dozens of different kinds you're likely to run across. So even after years on the job, don't be surprised if you encounter a type of wrench that you've never seen before. The next tool is a screwdriver. How do you use it as a wrench? If any family of tools deserves the title of most abused, this is it, screwdrivers. Screwdrivers are designed to turn screws, and that's all. They're not chisels. Their tips and handles can't withstand striking forces. And most are not designed to be turned with wrenches, which can damage both the screwdriver and the screw. But the most common abuse is using screwdrivers as pry bars, a practice that can bend and weaken the tool permanently. It's no wonder it's sometimes difficult to find a screwdriver in good enough condition to drive or remove screws. So the first thing to remember about screwdrivers is that they're screwdrivers and should be used only for the purpose they're designed for. It's also good to know a few of the parts of a screwdriver since we'll be talking about them in this segment. This, of course, is the handle. Since this handle is wood, which can split when force is exerted on it, this screwdriver also has a metal sleeve called a ferrule, which helps the wooden handle to withstand twisting forces. Next is the shank and the flattened part called the blade. At the end of the blade is the part that does the work, the tip. One interesting fact about the blade and tip is that even though they have to withstand the most stress, they're thinner than other parts of the tool. Because of this, screwdriver tips are specially tempered to make them strong and durable. But no matter how well tempered a tip is, 
It needs special care to stay in good condition, as we'll see in a moment. Now, this is another standard screwdriver. It has what's called a flange blade, a flat, smooth blade for general use. Standard screwdrivers are used on slotted head screws like these. Because screwdrivers are available in a variety of sizes, you have to be able to choose the right screwdriver for the job. Now, there are two guidelines for selecting the right screwdriver. First, make sure the tip fits the slot of the screw properly. And second, select the longest screwdriver that's comfortable to use. With this selection of different size screws, we can see how to identify the proper size tip. The blade on this screwdriver is too large for this screw. The tip doesn't reach the bottom of the slot, and the edges of the tip extend out beyond the edge of the screw. When the tip extends beyond the edge of the screw, it can damage the work. To drive this second screw, we need a larger screwdriver than this one. The blade on this one doesn't fit snugly into the slot. See how much play there is between the blade and the slot? Also, the tip isn't wide enough to fill the length of the slot. The screwdriver fits perfectly into this third screw. The tip reaches the bottom of the slot, and the blade fits snugly against the sides of the slot. In addition, the tip extends along the full length of the slot, but not beyond the edge of the screw. Now, I mentioned that it's also important to use the longest possible screwdriver. This is because the longer the screwdriver, the more leverage it gives. In most cases, the length of the tool is somewhat related to the size of the tip. So, for example, a very long screwdriver will usually have a proportionately large tip. Once you've selected the proper size screwdriver, be certain it's in good condition. The shank should be straight and firmly seated in the handle. And the tip should be smooth and even along all edges. If you're working with a wooden handle tool, you'll save your hands some pain if you also check the handle for cracks and splinters. The procedure for using a screwdriver is very simple if you remember that a screwdriver is an extension of your arm and wrist. With the screwdriver held firmly in the palm, the shank should extend to almost a straight line out from your arm. Then exerting as much downward force as necessary to keep the blade in the slot, the screw is turned clockwise to tighten it or counterclockwise to remove it. Instead of removing the tip from the slot after each turn, it's easier to hold the screwdriver in position with your free hand while changing your grip. When the screw is firmly seated, stop. Don't over tighten screws since this can ruin their threads. In addition to the standard flange tip screwdriver, these two are also common. The Phillips screwdriver and the Reed and Prince screwdriver. Although they look the same, they're not, and they're not interchangeable. The Phillips screwdriver has a blunt tip. Its flutes are set at a 30 degree angle. And if you look at a Phillips head screw, you'll see that the walls between the slots are beveled. Only a Phillips screwdriver properly fits a Phillips head screw. Reed and print screwdrivers, on the other hand, have pointed tips and their flutes are set at a 45 degree angle. Looking at a reed and print screw, you'll also notice that the walls between the slots are straight and pointed. The only tool that will properly fit this screw is a reed and print screwdriver. The advantage of both designs is simple. A screwdriver is less likely to slip out of a Phillips head or reed and print head screw than out of a straight slotted screw. Is there a difference between how the two are used? Not really, although you usually have to exert more downward pressure when using a Phillips screwdriver to keep its blunt tip in place. Basically then, there are three common types of screwdrivers. Standard, like these, Phillips, and Reed and Prince. 
but there are various forms of each kind. For places where there isn't enough clearance to use a straight screwdriver, for example, there are offset screwdrivers. The blades are curved at 90 degrees from the handle, one parallel and one perpendicular. One drawback to using an offset screwdriver is that it's difficult to exert downward pressure on it. So there's always the chance of the screwdriver slipping out of its slot. Earlier, I mentioned that most screwdrivers aren't designed to have a wrench attached to them. That implies that some are. Well, this one is equipped for a wrench to be attached to it. Notice that part of the shank is hexagonal and thicker than the rest. This section is designed for attaching an open-end wrench to get extra leverage when you're breaking free a really stubborn screw. In most cases, it's necessary to have two people to do the job, one to turn the wrench and the other to exert downward pressure on the screwdriver. Otherwise, the leverage of the wrench will force the screwdriver out of the hole. That covers the basics of selecting and using screwdrivers. But not all screws and screwdrivers you'll work with will be in top condition. So let me offer a few tips for handling certain problems. You're going to run into screws that have slots filled with grit, rust, and dirt. Clean the slot out as much as possible before trying to remove the screw. If the screw is one of those that just doesn't want to be removed, try a little penetrating oil as long as the oil won't damage the base work. If the screw is really stubborn, first tighten it slightly and then turn it counterclockwise. In many cases, the screw will loosen up. When you're required to tighten screws in an object you can hold in your hand, don't. A screwdriver isn't a knife, but it does have a point. Set the work down or steady it in a vise if necessary and keep all parts of your body away from the tip of the tool. Remember also that screwdrivers are often misused. This means that you're likely to find more than your share of screwdrivers with damaged tips. Now there's no reason to throw this screwdriver away. You can grind it back into proper shape on a grinding wheel. Reed and Prince and Phillips screwdrivers can also be dressed and you'll find the specific procedures in your text. That covers most of the basics about screwdrivers except for storage. The storage rules are common sense. Clean them after use and wipe their metal surfaces with a lightly oiled rag. Also, be sure to store screwdrivers with wooden handles away from sunlight and moisture that can affect the wood. In this unit, we've seen only a few of the many types of hammers, wrenches, and screwdrivers you'll run across on the job. When you spot someone using a type of wrench you've never seen before, find out how it's used. Expand your knowledge of tools. Learn to use tools well and value them for the time and effort they save you. Mastery of tools is the mark of a craftsperson, the person who knows what to use and what to do in almost any situation. It is one of the most essential skills for building and maintaining all types of equipment, from the equipment that keeps the world in motion to the equipment that enables the world to reach out to its neighbors.